Welcome to video 8 in the pseudocode series. In this video we're going to be looking at object orientated programming. Now this video is very slightly longer than what we used to but please stay with me until the end so that you've got all of the syntax in your notes so that you can answer confidently especially when we get to component 2. There's a section called section B where typically you have to use a lot of object orientated syntax and understand the theory behind it so it's going to be really useful for that last 40 marks in the component 2 exam. So we're going to start with the key theory so that's the language that you guys have got to be able to use and also looking at the four pillars of object orientated programming. We're then going to go on to the syntax that OCI would like you to pick up so things like public and private, get and set methods, creating instances, constructors, inheritance and then finally we're going to look at the class hierarchy and how to access super classes using the super keyword. Now, in order for you guys to become really successful learners and be able to solve the problems that you will be facing in your exams using both classes and objects, you really have to pay close attention to the key terms and the language that's specific to the questions that you're going to face. So whenever you read, you write or you verbalize a response using classes and objects and the theory of classes and objects, practice using the language. It's really vital that you do this so that it becomes second nature. I will pay particular attention to the language that you guys have got to learn and to use to be successful so that you guys can hear it being used and fingers crossed you'll be able to then use it in your own written responses, verbal responses and also understand it when you're reading. So our first two key terms, we've got a class and an object or classes and objects. Now you can think of these two terms really working together hand in hand. A class is thought of as the template for an object. So a really common example when we're thinking about this is that we might have a blueprint for a house and that's like the class and then the object would be the actual house that we build using that particular template. One particular object using a class template is called an instance of a class or we say that we instantiate an object from a class. A major benefit of using object orientated programming is that it allows us to reuse code once we've designed our class and then once we've implemented it and tested it we can use it again and again which is incredibly useful and massively beneficial. Our objects and classes are made out of attributes and methods. Attributes are also called properties so if you see this term when you're doing any research or you're reading on the web being essentially the same thing. An attribute is a variable that allows us to source some data to do with that particular object. Methods are the actions that the object can perform and they are the subroutines that we can call. We're used to calling them procedures and functions but when we put them inside a class or an object we call them a method. Let's have a look. So you can see that we've got a class called example and we've got an attribute that we've set to private called attempts and we've initialized it to B3. We've then got our procedure, set attempts. We essentially have got a method called set attempts. It's a procedure though because it doesn't return anything. We've also then got a public function called get attempts. Now this does return something, it returns whatever attempts is currently. So we've declared that as a function, but again, we'd still call that a method. So both of these procedures and functions are both classed as methods because they're inside a class. In Python, it would simply look like this. So we're still going to use the def key term and you can see that the top one is our equivalent of a procedure. We don't return anything. And the function on line six is a function because we return a value on line seven. So this is kind of the Python equivalent of a procedure and a function inside a class. This is the C sharp equivalent. So you can see our first print date procedure is void. Now the void key term simply means that we're not returning anything. So you can consider that our equivalent of the procedure. And then the second one, find average, is set to be a double. So when we return, we're going to be returning a type that is a double, and that's the equivalent of our function. So you can see how it works with different languages. Now, I've already mentioned that there are four pillars of object-orientated design. We have abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Let's have a look at them in a little bit more detail. We've met abstraction before, and it's often said that computer science is the science of abstraction. So that's where we create the right model for thinking about a particular problem and then generating a focused solution to help us solve that problem. We define abstraction 
as the process of filtering out or ignoring the characteristics of patterns or irrelevant detail that we don't need. Then we can concentrate on those things that we really do need. Now we've also met the key term encapsulation before. When we wrapped our data in subroutines such as procedures or functions, I talked about encapsulation then. When we use it in OOP, we can essentially declare attributes and methods as private. We saw that in an example a few uh, moments ago. You can also think of encapsulation as ensuring that we, if we've got two objects instantiated from the same class, that we can work with them independently of each other. So if we've got an enemy class and we create two instances, enemy one and enemy two, we don't want enemy two to die when enemy one dies. We want them to work independently of each other. Now we can design our code to have both class variables and instance variables. So I'll put a little asterisk there. Now we don't necessarily need to know about how to use those and we just consider everything an instance variable or an instance method when we're using pseudocode. But I'll just jog your memory a little bit with an example that we went through when we looked at this very briefly in Python. So as you can see, we've got a class called girl and we've got a class variable where we've set a gender to female and that is the same across the board. It doesn't matter which instance, that variable is still going to contain female. We can also set name to be unique. So we call that an instance variable. It is unique to each instance that we create. So when we create R, we set it to be equal to Lois Lane. And then when we create S, we set that to be equal to Natasha Romanoff. Third on our list, we have inheritance. So much in the same way that my sons will have inherited certain attributes from me, so blue eyes, for example, we can inherit attributes and methods from classes. We would say that we would then inherit the attributes and methods from a parent class into a child class. Now, there is lots of different terminology for this, so you've got to be aware that we can also call a parent class as a base class or a super class, and the child class could also be described as a subclass. We'll have a look at that in a moment as well. Last up, we've got polymorphism. So polymorphic, or to be polymorphic, is from the Greek to mean many forms. So this essentially means that we can change the behavior of a method based upon the context that we would like to use it in. Now there are different types of polymorphism. So as you can see, we can override the behavior in a subclass of a method that's from the parent class, and we class this as dynamic polymorphism. I'll show you an example in a second. And overloading is where we pass different arguments up and our program has to be able to handle these different inputs and it will respond depending on what data it receives effectively. So on the left, we've got an example of overriding. So we've got a base class called animal and it has a subroutine called sound. When we run that, it would just say this is a parent class. We've then got an inherited class. So dog inherits from animal. Now you can see in the animal class that we've got the virtual keyword before sound. And virtual means that we're allowed to then override it. So when we do public override void sound, we can change the behavior so that it's unique to dog. Because we don't want our dog to say this is a parent class. We want it to say that dogs bark. So we're changing the behavior depending on how we see fit. On the right hand side, you can see examples of overloading. So this is where we've got the same subroutine. We've got print area. Print area could either accept two integers or a single integer or an integer and a double or a single double. And depending on what it receives, it will run a different subroutine. This is again being polymorphic because the behavior is changing depending upon the arguments that are sent through. Right then, let's have a look at some actual syntax. We'll start with public and private. So public essentially means that when you use the dot notation, you'll be able to see either the attribute or method as part of the instance that you've created. Private, however, means that that data or the method is hidden away. Now it does say that methods and attributes can be assumed to be public unless otherwise stated. Okay, so if you don't see the key term private, then it's public. It also mentions that where the access level is relevant to the question, it will always be explicit. So it'll be really clear and denoted by the keywords. So we've got a class again called example. You'll see that example's got a capital letter. Now attempts is private. We can't access attempts unless we do it through our procedures and functions. 
So we've got a public procedure which allows us to set the number inside attempts. And we've got a public function which allows us to return what attempts is currently stored as. So if we run the code, you can see that we've got player.setAttempts and that allows us to change attempts effectively from three to five. So when you do player.setAttempts, we use the dot notation, we access the public procedure, set attempts, we pass it a number as a parameter, and then and then number is effectively assigned to attempts. The only way that we can find out what is in attempts is by using a get attempts method. So we do play.getAttempts, and because this is a function this time, we return that value and we could print it out to screen like in the example. Now, hiding this data away, making sure that nobody can access it without using the interface that we want is an example of what? So if you can remember from our four pillars, hopefully you guess right and you use the key term encapsulation. So this idea that we are encapsulating our data and we only allow access to it through the interfaces, the public methods that we provide. A constructor is a special type of method that is called whenever we create a new instance of an object. It always has exactly the same format. So you've got to remember the phrase public procedure new. Whenever you see public procedure new, it's always a constructor and then we can pass it arguments and then you can pass it data as parameters. In this case, we've got a pet. It's going to be given a name. Again, we've got a private name. And when we create an instance, we will assign that name, given name to our private attribute name. So let's have a look at an example. So we've got my pet equals new pet and we're gonna call our pet Brian. The other key skill that you're always gonna to have to do in an exam is to create an instance. Now we've just met that, but we need to know the generic code for it. So the generic code for creating an instance is towards the bottom. It says to create an instance of an object, the following format is used. So we have object name equals new class name and then however many parameters there are and the parameters also need to be in the right order so you can see in the example below we've got my dog equals new dog and then we've got an argument called fido and an argument called scottish terrier and they will essentially become given name and given breed now another one of our pillars was this idea of inheritance so we've got a pet class and we assign a private name and we also have a constructor for assigning that name we can say that dog inherits from pet that then allows us to have access to the name and we don't have to write it out again um, but when we're creating our inherited class we can use the key term inherits that's what OCR kind of suggests but in mark schemes I've also seen it being allowed that you can use um, pet in parentheses or you could put class dog colon colon pet and um, all these have, have been accepted in previous years and um, I would stick to inherits it makes it really clear and it's probably the easiest to remember that then gives us access to any attributes or methods from our parent class right last up we've got this idea of a class hierarchy and accessing attributes and methods in the super class using the super key term now you'll have seen from the example on the previous slide that when we created an instance of dog, we passed it Fido and Scottish Terrier. Now that would then go to the constructor that's inside dog. Okay, we've talked about polymorphism and we can change the behavior depending on what we would like it to do. But we've already got some code inside pet that allows us to assign the name. Now, if we want to use the code that's already existing inside pet, we have to use the super key term in order to access that code. So as you can see, it says public procedure new, given name, given breed. Now, given name, assigning the name, already exists inside pet, where it says name equals given name. So to force that behavior to happen, we need to do super dot new and then given name. Okay, so that's saying run the new procedure inside pet, Next up, we're going to be looking at how to use different programming constructs to solve different types of pseudocode question, and then we'll build up to some object oriented programming pseudocode questions so you can see how they are much of a muchness. There's about five different techniques that you've got to be able to use in an exam. Once you get used to how OCR structure the questions, you should be able to answer the vast majority of them as long as you can remember all of the syntax that we've mentioned in the video. Thanks very much for watching. Hope to see you next time.